Um, and so this is something that we continue to work at and strive towards. And there's going to be bumps and, and, and things along the way that don't work out, but we, we continue trying because we believe. So when I was speaking earlier, we talked a lot about uh, firearms and how firearms contribute to suicide. This presentation goes into that a little bit more, but you'll notice from the title, this isn't about guns. This isn't about firearms. This is about suicide prevention, and it's about safety. And so you could swap that out with a lot of other methods of suicide as well, and I think would apply just the same. We're going to be using firearms as our focal point because they make such a large contribution and so many suicides are directly due to that. I'm going to talk about why that is. Uh, but again, it, it's less about that and more about how do we start making changes in the rates of suicide that, that we're observing. Okay, so I'm going to start with the disclaimer. Um, everything I say is my own opinion. It does not reflect uh, the official policy of the VA. Um, I'm, I'm not representing the VA as, a, as an agent. I'm speaking as, as a, a psychologist, essentially. Um, I also want to point out that there's a paper published uh, just recently um, related to this, so if anybody wants to dive in further on this topic, um, I would point you towards that. Not because it's especially insightful or, or you know, great in any way, but because we, we really tried to pull on a comprehensive list of resources and references, and so it's a good starting point for diving into this issue and, and exploring it more. So goals for today. We're going to examine current lethal means safety conversations. We're going to discuss the intersection of veteran culture and lethal means safety. Okay? Um, we can't have one without the other. We can't sit here and talk about reducing suicide and increasing lethal means safety without cultural considerations. And then finally, we're going to talk about safety having various meanings and that we have to look at what safety means on a cultural level and how that interacts with um, specific suicide methods. So, you guys have done this long enough, you know that role plays are usually at the end of the training, not at the beginning, right? We're going to switch that up today. But, I'm going to be kind. Mm -hmm. You don't have to role play specifically, I just need somebody who wants to read off half the slide here with me. Anybody volunteer? Come on up. Where do you want me to start? So I'm going to have you be the clinician. Okay. And I'm going to be John. Okay. So, so what's your name? Ahmad. So Ahmad and I are having a conversation about lethal means safety. Uh, we're doing an intake or something like that, and I have mentioned that I have thoughts of suicide, mm, kind of ambivalent about what I'm going to do around that. Uh, and you're concerned, okay? And we're, we're starting to talk about lethal means safety. Now, here's, here's the, the heads up on this. This is not an ideal conversation, so don't, don't hold it against us. We're going to use this as an example, though, for how we can make improvements. Go ahead. John, I'm concerned about the risk your gun poses to your safety. I think we need to get it out of the house. The risk is just too high. You know, I've, I've, I've got it under control. Um, my gun isn't going anywhere. Well, what about locking it up? <coughs> Here, let me get you a gun lock. It's one of those with the cable that locks to make a loop so it can't, it can't be fired. Oh, what's the point of that? What, I'm, what am I supposed to do if I need my gun? Go look for my keys while someone breaks into my house? Plus that piece of crap, dinky cable lock would ruin my gun. This is something my grandfather gave me. Okay, well, would you be willing to store your ammunition separately from your gun? Gotta be kidding me. All right, it's time to get out of here. Look, I have my handgun for home defense. Have you heard about everything that's going on? That totally defeats the purpose of self-defense in an emergency situation. What about giving it to someone else close to you to keep it safe for the time being? You have a brother, right? Not going to happen. I'm the only one I trust in my fucking. Yeah, um, let me text him real quick. <laughs> right. OK, great. Can you give me a call later in the week to let me know that you got the gun out of the house? No. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely do that. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Okay, so I, I'm sure you know we've all had versions of a conversation like this where 
You're trying your best, you're trying to promote lethal means safety, but the conversation is really not going anywhere, and maybe in some ways it's working against you, right? What's missing from this? Uh, the veteran's opinion. What does he want to do? Yeah. How, how, how can he uh, come up with a suggestion that might work? Totally. Buy it. Yeah. Uh, again, the clinician here is telling him what needs to happen. He's not working with him to find a solution. There's no buy in. Yeah. Maybe focusing more on safety. Right. It's very specific to the firearm. He's concerned about that. You know, there could be a good reason for that. But the bigger issue is safety. You're absolutely right. Okay. So as we go through, keep those in mind because that's really what we're going to be talking about. So I, I promise I'm not going to rehash all of the data we did from the previous talk. <laughs> But a couple of highlights. So again, suicide uh, is a top 10 cause of death amongst adults. Over the last two decades, there's been a considerable increase in rates um, during that time. Uh, the rate for veterans is currently 26.9 per 100,000. Uh, when we look at the military population, so a question came up about that earlier, uh, we see that the rates have essentially doubled to where they were from about the year 2000 to the current period. And as rates of prison, uh, our understanding of the causes and the interventions and all of those things that we would need to know to create a change really haven't progressed. There's been a ton of research, there's been a lot of effort into this, but one, suicide is a difficult topic to research because how do you randomize somebody to do that to do a clinical trial? And it's such a low base rate event that just looking at the occurrence of suicide means that you're doing a multi-decade study. Um, so it's just really, really difficult to do. Regardless, personal firearm use continues to be the most common method for suicide. We see rates of about half of all US suicides being due to firearms, 67% of military suicides, and 70% of veteran suicides. So one thing I always like to point out is suicide is a rare but a catastrophic event. Now, you can imagine that all of these little squares here each contain 100 little individual dots. And you can think of this as our sample of the population. There's 100,000 individual dots. And what we're talking about are the 26, 27 shaded red ones. Okay. And in this diagram, it's easy to kind of point out where those are and who's essentially at risk for suicide, right? But imagine if those were colored the same as everything else and they were interspersed and they look just like all the other dots. Now, how likely are you to be able to predict who's really at risk and who's not? If we were able to predict who's at risk, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we could target interventions to them. But the problem is, the folks who are at risk look just like the folks who aren't. In fact, they share a lot of the same characteristics. Young or old, white or Native American, men. Okay? That's a huge swath of our population if we're trying to pinpoint who exactly is going to die by suicide and who's not. And there's a cost. There's a cost for false positives, right? Because you're labeling somebody and saying, you're at risk, you need special services, you need to be uh, you know, engaged in these specific programs, when in reality, the risk is no higher than the person next to them. And there's a risk for false negatives as well, right? you miss somebody who really was at risk. And what then? How do you cope with that? We heard you know, Clark earlier talking about the impact that has on you as a provider emotionally when that happens. And it's a terrible burden. So predicting suicide is extremely, extremely difficult. And the reason that I'm focusing specifically on firearms and firearm safety is because of these three factors. Not This is factor one here. The time between the, the point at which somebody makes a decision to engage in suicide-related behavior and when they actually act on that decision. Okay. For 71% of people, it's within an hour. So there's a short period of time in which they might reconsider, right? or during which intervention can happen. Half say it was less than 20 minutes, and a quarter says it was less than five minutes. These are people who have engaged in suicide-related behavior and survived. Okay. So we're not talking about 
days or weeks or months. We're talking about minutes between the decision and the action. So that's, that's concern one. Concern two is that firearms are extremely legal and extremely immediate. 85 to 90% of suicide attempts involving a firearm will result in death, okay? Only 5% of all other methods are fatal. That's a huge disparity between those two. When you overdose on a medication, it takes minutes to hours for that medication to enter your bloodstream. If you are going to jump off a building, you have to climb upstairs or take the longest elevator ride of your life. Okay. If you are going to hang yourself, there's preparatory work involved to make that happen. Those are all moments for folks to reconsider, to bump into somebody that they weren't counting on who might talk them out of it, for them to reach out to somebody and ask for help. Okay. You don't have those opportunities when the intention is to shoot yourself. And the third factor is uh, one we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. So does anybody know who this is? So this is a gentleman named Kevin Hines. He's a speaker now about suicide prevention. I had um, the opportunity to see him talk and share his story back in 2016. And that was 16 years after he jumped off of the Golden Gate Bridge and lived. Yeah, highly unlikely that that would happen, but he did. And what Kevin talks about, and I don't, you know, the other two we have data to support. I don't have data to support this, but what he's mentioned and what I hear frequently talking with um, survivors of suicide attempts is that the moment they engaged in the action, they immediately regretted it. And he talks very clearly about the moment his feet left the bridge deck, he wished he could change his mind. He wished he could do something different, but he was falling. And he fell all the way into the water and severely injured his legs and kind of was lucky enough to float to a point where he could pull himself up on the shore. Okay. Again, you don't have that option with a firearm. And so in that context, you know, Kevin's story is, is irrelevant. It's too late. You can't change it once you pull the trigger. So what do we know about fire ship, firearm ownership in the US? Um, so there's a 2015 National Firearm Survey found that 50% of all veterans reported owning at least one firearm. Um, protection from others was cited as the primary reason for owning it. One in three reported that uh, they store their at least one firearm loaded and unlocked. One in five reported storing all of their firearms unloaded and, and uh, locked. Um, unsafe storage practices correlate with agreement that a lack of immediate access reduces the utility for self-protection. Okay, so again, they're saying that leaving my weapon loaded and uh, accessible correlates with uh, my safety, essentially. 6% of veterans agree that having a firearm in the home increases suicide risk, so only minority there. But 82% reported that you know, if they knew somebody in their home was having thoughts of suicide, they would take steps um, to make sure that that firearm that they have could not be accessed. So there's sort of a disparity between like, well, if I knew about it, that's what I would do, but I'm not gonna do it otherwise. Just, it's interesting. So when we talk about lethal means safety, we have to consider this. And we have to think not only on the micro level, that individual client or patient that you're working with, but also sort of on a macro level of what are we doing as a state, as a society, um, as a culture. And so let's look at some other examples of where lethal means safety has been really, really impactful. Okay, so we talked about the Golden Gate Bridge. Here it is. And it is now dressed up with bridge nets. Okay, you can see those here. So if somebody jumps off, uh, they fall a short distance and then they're caught and they have a difficult time getting out of those nets and by the time they do, the fire department is able to get there um, and essentially rescue them. So there's a meta-analysis done of bridge nets that were installed um, primarily at suicide hotspots. So the Golden Gate Bridge, the Coronado Bridge in San Diego, um, various other places. 
And what they found were an 86% reduction in suicides at various sites, at those specific sites where there had been really high rates beforehand. Uh, coal cooking gas in Great Britain. Okay. Anybody remember these old stoves? <laughs> so prior to the 50s, domestic gas in the UK was primarily derived from coal, which contains 10 to 20% carbon monoxide. And so it's the old adage of the housewife sticking her head in the oven and essentially asphyxiating. So poisoning by gas inhalation was the leading to suicide in the UK until 1958 when natural gas, which has zero carbon monoxide, was actually introduced. And by 1971, um, two thirds essentially of gas stoves were using natural gas instead of coal gas. What they found is that as carbon monoxide exposure decreased dramatically, so did suicide rates. Okay. And there was not an overall increase in other methods of suicide. Those stayed stable. So the result was a net decrease in suicide, particularly among women who were the ones accessing this, this particular method. If we move to Sri Lanka, um, there was a uh, very concerning pattern that kind of occurred over the last couple of decades about pesticide ingestion. And you have a lot of folks who have ready access to pesticides, and they would, as a method of suicide, um, consume that and poison themselves, essentially. What they found there is that efforts to reduce access to those pesticides were not effective that it couldn't happen on the individual level. So nationally, they took, a, took a, a step towards actually banning five lethal compounds um, from pesticides that they were using. And by not having those lethal ingredients present, um, they were able to reduce suicide rates because folks can no longer access them overall. And then finally, weapons storage. So if we look at the Israeli Defense Force, they had a program um, not too long ago, really, where they required all their service members to turn in their weapons um, during certain periods of time, uh, usually the weekends. And what they found is a 40% decrease in suicides um, during those periods when weapons were turned in. <coughs> so lethal means safety can be very effective when it happens on a large scale. Okay. Now that's where we get to lethal means counseling because that's what we're trying to do in these clinical interactions is talk about increasing our safety with these things that are potentially dangerous. So it's grounded in the finding that, like all of those examples, when you reduce the access to one means of suicide, folks generally are not going to substitute that with a different means, right? If I can't jump off a bridge, I'm not then gonna go buy a gun. Um, if I can't access my gun, I'm not gonna then go jump off the bridge. Um, folks generally have a plan, they get kind of fixated on that plan. And so if we can remove access to that, chances are you're going to give them time to get out of that one hour period, essentially, a golden hour, and receive an opportunity for intervention. So lethal means counseling can reduce rates of suicide. Training in lethal means counseling has been shown to improve uh, not only safety, but knowledge and attitudes amongst trainees. Okay. So if we're training our next generation of clinicians and we're teaching them about the value of lethal means counseling, well, what do we know folks do in their professional lives? They do what they learn during graduate school or during their professional training. That pattern will continue on. And there's evidence that shows that when you do lethal means counseling and distribute safety devices such as gun locks, it increases the likelihood that those safety tools are utilized. But there are some challenges as well. Okay. So one, there's over 265 million firearms already in legal private ownership. Um, chances are if somebody shoots themselves uh, in a suicide uh, just in a behavior, um, they didn't go out and buy a gun. They already had the gun. Okay. Um, most people um, you know, are not going to respond then or the value isn't going to be there for preventing uh, acquisition of new firearms. We need to be talking about how do we uh, increase safety in the person's home environment that's already sort of set up. Um, the other thing is that your patients are probably, I know we have a lot of veteran providers in here, but for folks like me that are not veterans, 
Um, chances are that your patients are either more familiar, more experienced, more facile, um, or knowledgeable about firearms than you are, right? And so having that conversation when you can't speak the language in the way that they do is a problem. Who here could name or reassemble all the parts of this firearm? Okay? Both those guys are veterans, if I remember correctly. Yeah? I have that at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you can't do that, when you're talking about lethal and safety with somebody, you're having a very general conversation. General conversations are great. Okay? We need to have specifics. We need to have specific plans, specific actions. Removing the firing pin. You guys could probably come point out where the firing pin is. Don't ask me to do that. I don't know. Okay, that's a problem. How many folks think they could install this gun lock right now fast? A few more, but not, not a majority. Okay. How many feel that they could be competent, and remember, as providers, competence is a key ethical construct of our professional identity. How many folks feel that they are competent to instruct somebody on how to install this safety device on that client's handgun. Even less. Yeah. Yeah. For information's sake, this is how you would do that. These are the different ways you can apply that. I had a provider um, who were doing some practice, thankfully, who was trying to do this, and they talked about taking this and looping it behind the trigger and kind of locking it over the top. That would not work. And that could actually result in some danger <laughs> just from doing that, right? Um, so being able to know exactly what needs to happen and have the proficiency to talk through that with somebody is important. Okay. Um, the email list that went around, by the way, has my email on it. If anybody wants gun locks like this, I go, like Cody said, they're not as nice as the clamshell or life jacket or a storage case that you can get other places, but it's better than nothing. If you need some of those, please let me know. I will ship you some for free. Okay, so we have an uphill battle because we have to learn how to be competent with those sorts of things. We need to know how firearms work and what the different parts are and how the ammunition fits in and how the magazine does and how to install safety devices. What we know when we look at our, our population of providers is that there's a lot of variation in how familiar providers are with firearms, but also how comfortable they are talking about them, right? And so we know that clinicians often have low levels of knowledge about practical aspects like we just demonstrated. Um, we know that there are variability in attitudes and screening practices found where few clinicians are actually talking about the safety aspects of lethal means. When we look at a review of clinician responses, so this is actually looking through the documentation, the medical records, for veterans who have endorsed suicidality, we find that only 15% of the time are clinicians bringing up lethal mean safety. 15% of the time. They're asking diagnostic history, they're asking about access to care, all the time, 100%. Only 15% of the time are they having a conversation about lethal means. Other studies have suggested that half of firearm, firearm owners report that discussions by their health providers are actually never appropriate. So it's not one side of the problem here. You know, it's not the clinicians failing. That's certainly a piece of it. We need to have more conversations. But our patients, our veterans that we're seeing, are also saying, like, hey, this is not the place to talk about this. Okay. And 90% of firearm owners agree that conversations about firearms are appropriate only when risk factors are present. But again, at that point, it's very likely that it's too late. So, potential problems, okay? Firearms are, by far, by far, the most common method for veteran suicide. We've established that. Um, many, many lethal means safety initiatives have been developed, or are being developed, and they're focusing on firearms, but we're not seeing changes. 
Research has also tried to characterize our ownership amongst veterans and optimal strategies for clinical messaging. But again, those efforts have not resulted in the changes that we would like to have seen. So despite this, um, patients often rate healthcare practitioners as having low credibility in discussing firearm safety. You don't know what you're talking about. Why would I listen to you? Just like in the role player there. A few clinicians, despite diverse backgrounds, are consistently screening or counseling about firearm safety, and clinicians are only doing that less than a quarter of the time. So why is that? Why is this such a, you know, I think we could probably pull people in this room and say like, hey, is this an important topic? And I think most folks would say yes. If I have somebody who is actively suicidal and they're saying they're gonna shoot themselves, I'm obligated to take an action about that, right? But we're not, we're failing here. So what I'm gonna be proposing is that there's a cultural mismatch between the clinical providers and the service members or veterans that they're working with. That makes discussing firearms uncomfortable or makes it seen as being off limits. Uh, folks may think that this invalidates uh, an important part of the service member or veteran's identity and so to avoid that, I just won't talk about it. Um, they might fear that it risks you know, the credibility or the rapport with the veteran that they've worked so hard to establish. Um, might limit the generalizability of a broad lethal means training. We can go on, everybody in this room could come up with a reason that would be valid. And at the end of the day, all of those things result in ineffective or non-existent lethal means safety interventions. And that's what we need to change. Now, when we look at VA mental health clinicians, and I'll use that because that's the group that I'm most familiar with, and um, no, but I'm, I'm, I fully expect that this would generalize out to the community as well, is that um, VA clinicians expressly state through focus groups that they have concerns about affecting the therapeutic relationship if they were to have that conversation, that they do lack knowledge or personal experience about firearms, and that the perceived consequences of discussing or not discussing with them firearms with the patient may actually be a barrier to even starting that conversation. Fearing the outcome of the conversation stops <coughs> from even starting the conversation. Okay. So, you know, if we were to kind of break this down into a, a, a scientific proposition here, my hypothesis is that those factors that influence disparities in healthcare delivery can be understood as cultural factors. The reason we're not asking about firearms and we're not having these conversations is because there's a cultural mismatch between ourselves and the veterans that we're serving. And we know that generally there's a culture gap, gap in the US uh, related to firearms. We know that firearm owners are likely to have their own cultural taboos related to asking or sharing information about firearms. And we know that it requires a trusting relationship established with an individual, right? This, this is my brother, this is my, this is my best friend, this is my you know, buddy from the service. I'm okay talking with guns about them, but I'm not so okay talking with you, provider, about these. There's also a lot of inaccurate beliefs and misperceptions about firearms and firearm ownerships and, and veterans in general. Um, and the research consistently shows that there's a, a correlation, a relationship between rates of firearm ownership and rates of suicide. We know that those things go hand in hand. We know that there's uh, a correlation between legislation to prevent firearm ownership for high-risk individuals and reduce suicide rates. So we know that reducing access can reduce suicide rates. Yet, when you survey the general public and you survey firearm owners, what we find is that people do not believe that firearm ownership actually increases suicide risk. And again, we can't take these as causal statements, but we can look at the sort of you know, support and suggested relationships around these, and the two things don't really match up. So what are some of the cultural values associated with firearms? Um, any Marines? Former Marines. Okay, anybody able to recite the Breckman's Creed? Or at least the first line of it? This is my right brother, this was my That's the one. my best friend. That's right. 
Yeah. I was fasting like I last in my own life. I will. You got it. Okay. Mm. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I master my life. My rifle without me is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. My rifle and I know that what counts in war is not the rounds we fire, the noise of our burst, nor the smoke we make. We know that it is the hits that count. We will hit. My rifle is human, even as I, because it is my life. Thus, I will learn it as a brother. I will learn it as a weakness. It's, I will learn its weaknesses. I will learn its strengths, its parts, its accessories, its sights, and its barrel. I will keep my rifle clean and ready, even as I am clean and ready. We will become part of each other. We will. Before God, I swear this creed, my rifle and I are the defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until victory is America's, and there are no enemies but peace. Okay? When did you first hear that in your service? Probably the first one. Yeah. Boot camp. This is ground in. This is this is the starting point, right? Cody earlier mentioned Brett Bass, who's um, at the University of Washington. He runs the the Safer Homes program. He can recite this uh, at will. Uh, he's also a firearms instructor. It's part of the culture, and you can find this on not only you know certificates like this, but coins and memorabilia, and T-shirts and posters and all sorts of stuff because it's part of the culture. It exemplifies the beliefs and the values and they are there to save your life when needed. It's part of the training, it's part of what you do. The Army actually goes so far as to consider any unintentional discharge, so if you accidentally misfire your gun and it's not you know, you're given the order to do so, as a neg negligent discharge, which could actually result in pretty severe consequences for you. Right? So there's a lot of care taken to build in values about safety and responsibility and the lethality of that weapon. Okay? But where are we pointing those values about safety and lethality and, and responsibility? Usually towards others, right? Protecting my buddy, protecting my squad, protecting myself from others. But not necessarily about protecting ourselves from ourselves. Couple that with the importance of a trusted messenger. Okay. And here's, here's the sad truth. We, except maybe the veterans in the room, are not it, okay, as mental health providers. We're not trusted messengers around this. Um, if folks want to wager a guess as to who might be considered a trusted messenger to provide information about lethal means safety? Client or patient. So who, who might the client or patient say, or in their head feel is a trusted person to, to get information about that from? Government. Okay, government. What else? Government. So fellow gun owners. Battle buddy. Battle buddy, peers, yeah. yeah. There are some others back there. Okay. Yeah, so high trust, law enforcement, hunting or outdoor organizations, uh, active duty military, military veterans, uh, professional associations like the NRA, low trust physicians, you can include in there other healthcare professionals um, and providers, and celebrities. I think that's the only time I have a, as a psychologist I've been coupled with like celebrities. Uh, not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, in here, we have an example of a high trust messenger. So this is the New York Department, uh, uh, State Department of Fish and Game, and they put out a very simple message. Uh, again, this is with this is not specific to suicide; it's about firearm safety in general. And they stated that um, you know they really encourage hunters to remember that every hunting-related shooting incident is preventable. Short and sweet, yet it reverberated throughout the firearm community in New York because they felt like, okay, they get it, they know that we're focused on 
safety and responsible handling of our firearms. There's nothing in here about you know, sort of negative judgment. Um, and we agree in our core that shooting incidents are preventable. Like, I'm not going to fire my weapon unless I mean to. Okay? What we need is trusted messengers to get messaging about lethal means safety, about suicide prevention out to those communities because we as providers cannot do that on a macro level. We can do it one-on-one -on -one with our patients, right? With a very careful, direct conversation. But if we're trying to educate the community as a whole, that's a much bigger problem. So that brings us to safety. And I told you this was, this was a, a presentation about safety. So when I say, what is safety, what do you guys, how do you define it? What is safety and how does culture apply to it? I suppose, simply, the absence of, or the reduction of danger. Right. And when you say danger, that could be really from any direction, right? Right. It could apply to multiple domains. I think that's the important point. The gentleman behind you also had a, a comment. Avoiding any unnecessary injury. Yeah. Unnecessary injuries or unintentional injuries, right? That there's purpose in, in each step, certainly. Any others? Okay. So if there's if there's one thing that I want you to leave this presentation with, it's an understanding that safety has multiple meanings. Okay. So generally, as healthcare professionals, when we talk about safety and our clients being safe, we're taking actions towards safety. We're talking about safety from suicide. We don't use that language, though. We talk about safety in general. We talk about how restricting access to lethal means can make you safer. Well, if my reason for possessing that firearm is self-defense or safety <coughs> for others, then locking it up, putting it away, giving it to somebody else, turning it in, decreases my safety. So why would I do that? Why are you telling me to do something that decreases my safety. We don't have that conversation though. We say, hey, we want you to be safe with this. Okay, sure. So we might, we might imply safety from suicide, but what the veteran hears you say is, you know, keep yourself safe, ensure your safety, lock up your weapons. They're not hearing safety from suicide in those communications. We need to be more explicit about being uh, very, focus on suicide prevention. So we must consider first what the veteran sees as their reason for firearm ownership. Maybe that's self-defense. Maybe they're collecting it as a hobby. They don't even have ammunition for it. Maybe it doesn't even fire anymore. Uh, maybe they're a hunter or enjoy outdoor activities and it's a safety thing for you know when they're out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe they're required to have that as part of their duty. If you have police officers, if you have military service members that you work with, they may be required to carry a weapon. And so openly discussing how increasing safety from suicide may require a reduction in safety from other priorities all of a sudden becomes a very different conversation because now you're talking about balancing safety. You're saying, I want you to prioritize over the next week, month, whatever, your safety from suicide. And to do that, we have to sacrifice temporarily these other forms of safety that I understand are very important to you, but put you at risk for suicide. Okay. Um, so home defense, that was the number one priority or reason folks cite for owning firearms. Um, again, you have to have that conversation where you acknowledge, okay, yeah, that means that if somebody breaks into your house during this time, you may not be able to do what you need to protect it, okay? But you're at such high risk right now of being the person that harms yourself that that's where we need to focus our attention. That's where we need to focus our sort of uh, strategy. So an individual who is primarily motivated from safety from others or in personal violence may feel that increasing barriers to firearm access actually reduces their effectiveness. And you have to sit with that. You have to make space to have that discussion and talk through it. 
and come to a point in conjunction with the veteran about how they're going to address that before they walk out your door, essentially. There are different ways of kind of conceptualizing this, and, and you know, again, this is from a cultural perspective, and so um, the sort of three white boxes here talk about those different approaches. So one is cultural awareness. Uh, that's the first one here. That's just understanding the individual's beliefs and values and why they're making certain choices. Um, it might also involve you kind of reflecting on your own beliefs and attitudes, right? Then there's the one in the center that's a multicultural approach, and it addresses sort of the evidence base and what the data have shown. Um, it recognizes that firearm culture represents a diverse set of values, beliefs, and practices, but we're going to go back to, to the data and all things. And then the third is a cross-cultural approach, and that's the one that we're really going to be advocating for here. And this addresses sort of clinical skills for lethal means counseling that includes culturally informed ways to ask about firearms. It aligns with the values that the veteran already has. It uses those to talk about how do we prioritize safety. And it shares and creates an open opportunity to discuss how safety, different aspects of safety, are impacted when we prioritize safety from suicide. So let's move into talking about recommendations, okay? What I'm advocating for here is a balanced conversation around lethal means, okay? Asking folks to take guns completely off the table is probably going to result in some resistance. So you have to have flexibility, okay? Focus less on correcting misperceptions on the relationship between firearm owners and suicide risk, and instead focus on the clinically relevant and culturally compatible relationship between firearm-related safety behavior and suicide risk, okay? Pull up Cooper's four rules. Go through them and say, hey, how does this make sense that you can adhere to these things, but you told me you just held that gun up to your head last week? That doesn't, that doesn't jive. How do, we, how do we reconcile that? Utilize culturally consistent messaging and discussion, talking about responsible handling of a firearm, talking about the rifle in the screen if you're sitting with a Marine, okay? And saying, hey, do you still believe in this? Do you still adhere to these values? You do, okay, so help me understand how we can maintain this respectful relationship between you and your firearm, because what you're telling me is that that's not in place right now, and I want you to be able to have that in your life. And that also seems like it could be something that would help you maintain your safety. And use that as a way to start that conversation about prioritizing safety from suicide, potentially over other forms of safety for a temporary period of time. Clarify the meaning of safety and respect or validate the intent of defensive firearm use to avoid safety or to avoid harm from others and danger from others. Okay? Remember, validation does not mean agreement. You don't have to agree with it. Okay? But what you have to do is take a non-judgmental, respectful approach in talking about it and having an open, non-judgmental conversation so you can actually make progress around that. With that, you have to refrain from dichotomizing firearm storage as either safe or unsafe. It's not one or the other. There's shades of gray in between. And refer explicitly and use explicit language around safety from home invasion, safety from accidents, and safety from suicide. And the fact of the matter is we've done this already in lots of other areas, okay? Um, we call it harm reduction, essentially. So motor vehicle safety. We've got folks wearing seatbelts, wearing motorcycle helmets, avoiding using their cell phone while driving. Those have led to dramatic decreases in fatalities from car accidents. Okay. Uh, any bicyclists in the room? Right? Yeah. You wear a helmet. You wear reflective clothing. Uh, you take steps to maintain your safety. If you have small kids, you know, you put them in a life jacket. You use the buddy system. Make sure that they're never alone around the pool. You uh, install a fence or a barrier so that they can't access it. Right? We do these things all the time. We just haven't been able to do it around firearms necessarily. Okay. 
Can anybody think of other examples where we've successfully integrated sort of safety into our everyday work? Yeah. I mean, that would be everyday for most of us, but uh, in hotels where the windows don't open at all or don't open fully because child children that can yeah. fall out. Right, accident prevention, absolutely. Construction sites? Yeah, so what specifically at construction sites? Goggles, safety helmet. Yeah, you don't go in one without your hard hat, your goggles, right, your vest. Mm -hmm. Think of like road workers too. Like, there are reasons that they are dressed in neon, so they can be seen. So along with that, there are a couple of other pathways, other ways to forward this, this sort of way of thinking. One would be the development of educational materials that are co-branded with trusted organizations so that you have that trusted messenger component present. Um, Peer-led initiatives in healthcare and community settings, so it's not the provider always having this conversation, but maybe it's a peer. It's that person you trust that are inherently a, a trusted messenger because they know your background. They've been there themselves. And then finally, partnership with firearm organizations to develop messages to firearm owners about recognizing suicide risk. You heard Cody talk earlier about some of the programs focused on um, gun retailers and, and as well as firearm ranges and their training programs. And adding in basic materials about recognizing the signs of suicide, right? Not as a way to dissuade them or change their minds, but as a way to educate them and have them be aware that, okay, there's a risk here. Just like there's a risk of injury or a risk of whatever else. I just need to be aware of it, okay? So again, firearms continue to be a high priority area just because they result in so many suicide deaths. That's why we're focusing on creating reductions in suicide rates. But clinicians often have low levels of practical knowledge, so that's a growth area for I think, our field to learn more about that, to be uh, facile with the language so that we can have those meaningful conversations. We have to learn how to balance the needs for lethal means counseling with uncertainty for how folks might receive that and just not avoid it altogether, but actually take the uncomfortable, difficult step of, ask, a step of asking about firearms. And then, recognize that we're doing cross-cultural communication, okay? That oftentimes an individual as a veteran represents a culture that we're not a part of. Sometimes we are. And that we need to approach that in a, a thoughtful, culturally considered manner. Um, and then really focusing again on talking about very specific aspects of safety. All right, I know I've done a lot of talking to you guys today. Thank you so much for, for hanging in there and for your attention. Um, let's, let's see if there's any questions. Okay, well, I'll be around all weekend, so if any come up, please, please uh, pull me aside and let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much.